excited to be here. You guys are fun. You guys are, you, you, uh, you dragged the best out of me. I really, and, uh, I need that help this morning. I just wrote myself a little note. You probably can't really see it from, from there, but I was reminded as we were singing the last song together that when I first gave my life to Christ, the church that I became involved with about a year after I surrendered to Jesus, they uh, invited me to be a worship leader. And here's the picture of me at that time. You know, jeans, holes in the knees, T-shirt. I know you won't believe this about me. (laughs) The hair had just been recently in the middle of my back, you know, hanging around downtown at Jack in the Box shirtless with a, you know, a headband and... (laughs) You know, this is just within a couple of years of that moment. <clears throat> and they invited me to lead worship. And I thought, there's what an incredible honor. And, and I really believe that. It was just a stupendous time in my life. But it, if I look back on it, and I, and I wonder, what were they thinking? <laughs> <laughs> and somehow this was going to hook me, and it, I guess it did. But when I would stand at the pulpit they had in the church that we had there, It had a white medical tape, you know, big, like inch and a half white medical tape. And they had put a, made a cross on the pulpit. And in the tape they had written on the crossbar, we would, and on the vertical, see Jesus. So every time you stood behind this podium, you were reminded (coughs) why we're here. Why do we gather? Why do we allow somebody to yell at us once a week like this? <laughs> Why do we go through these regular spiritual exercises that we, we do enjoy? Amen? We enjoy being together. We enjoy being in his presence. Uh, some of us enjoy being in sandwiched between two other people who can actually sing. <laughs> and, and carry us. For half of the time we're together, and uh, we enjoy fellowship. And the reason, though, for all of this is that we would see Jesus. And I enjoy and have enjoyed being here all the times you've allowed me to come and, and Pastor Bill's invitation. I love your pastor. And I see a lot of Jesus when I come here. There are a few of you I want to talk to, though. <laughs> Just kidding. You know me enough by now. I, I understand we do have some uh, visitors with us this morning, and I extend my apologies to you for my being here and not re- getting to see Pastor Bill. But if you can endure me just for a little while, then you could come again next week and get the real deal. I can hear somebody wondering, well, I wonder what he's going to say next. (laughs) Why is he pausing? Has he forgotten why he's here? Senior moment. moment. No. I just, you might not believe this, but I still get nervous when I preach. I've been doing it for 40 years. And there's a story that I, I remind myself with is the the younger guy asked the senior guy, do you still get nervous when you preach? Do you get those butterflies that just, they're just all over? He said, you better hope you never lose those, son. Don't ever lose those. He said, but I will tell you this, after a few years and some experience, you can teach them to fly in formation. That's what I was pausing for. I was trying to get him to fly in some kind of pattern because I'm nervous. So let me surrender that to him. Heavenly Father, you know. You know what's going on inside of me right now. You feel what I feel. I know that. You are so intimate. You know us as a body this morning that we've gathered to see Jesus. We're here for really one reason, and that's to be touched by you. 
And so, Holy Spirit, we invite you to move inside of us as only you can, to speak into the inner man, the spiritual one in each of us today, and help us to grasp what you're speaking to us. Help us to get a hold of that piece of revelation and insight that you've designed for us today so that we can grow from it, so that we can taste and see that you are good. Lord, I submit to you my butterflies and ask you to put them in formation in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This has been an interesting time for me to have the, the questions, the God questions to answer. You know, normally you just come and preach whatever the Lord gives us, but in this case, we've been handed a topic. And it's a question, evidently, that one of you have asked, if not more than one of you. How can I change the people around me? How can I change the people around me? So at this point in the message, I'd like to invite my wife, Peggy, to come. <laughs> and, and, and tell you that it's just not possible. <laughs> she's been working on it for 36 years almost, and, uh, and she's got more to go. Amen? Amen. How can I change the people around me? I, it's a tough question. Because he knows we'd love to, in a lot of times, alter what's happening in the lives of those around us. You know, a question like this can really speak to issues of our own heart. What's going on inside of us? Is it that they irritate us and we want that to change? Is it that they're not enough like us? And wouldn't that be crazy if you could get them all to be like you? And then you'd really be nervous <laughs> about that. <laughs> so that can't be it, but we, we what is it? They're, you know, going right at it. Some of the concepts that come along with this kind of an attitude that comes from within us saying, I want, I want them to change. I want the people around me to be different can stem from our own hurt, our own shame, our own issues, uh, our own upbringing. Our, and, you know, I've talked about things like this here before, the, the trauma things that we've gone through in life that have affected us negatively, sometimes created us even a, an issue of codependency. We're enabling and I'm not a psychologist, I'm not a psychiatrist, I'm, I'm just like you, I just love Jesus. And, and he's given us some answers to these things. And I think that really the answer this morning, how can I change the people around me, there are, there are some possibilities. But the first answer that we have to collide with is that I really can't do it. And how can we come to that conclusion? Well, maybe I can. Wait, Pastor Jeff, you're not, you don't know my situation. I, there's some people, I think I could do something with these people I'm with. Okay, let's try and defeat that. Let's just imagine you're walking in, you just got up, you're walking into your bathroom, you're crusty-eyed, and you're, the Sandman's left a deposit, and you're dealing with that. And so you splash water on your face, and then you look in the mirror, ask the question right then, how much have I been able to change that one in the mirror? How effectively have I made changes to the person in the mirror? And that's just a legitimate question. Have I done well? Weren't there all those times I said I would change, but I didn't, and I just made a decision, whether it was January 1st or not, to make an alteration of my own life, and I'm going to be different? I read a story this year on January 1st that just cracked me up. Guy says, I'm starting a new business. That's my, that's my uh, New Year's resolution. I'm going to start a new business. And I'm going to rent this building. And for two weeks, the first two weeks of the year, it's, it's a health place. You know, treadmills and all the steppers and, and the ellipticals and the weights and the mirrors. And for two weeks, anybody that wants to come can come for free because all the people that make those resolutions, right? So I'm going to make it easy for them for two weeks free. The third week, I'm converting it into a bar. 
Why? Because they're all going to give up in two weeks. And I'm still going to make money. I probably used, should have used something other than a bar in the story because you guys didn't like that. It just should have been a restaurant. Yeah, fast food Yeah. And I thought, that's how effective we are at changing ourselves. I'm going to do better. And I submit to you that when you come into a situation like you're in this morning where somebody's presenting the gospel or a message from the scripture, that you develop an ear to listen for this. Are we trying to tell you that you're still under a law that says you got to do better? You got to measure up? You have to perform? You have to make God happy? Or are we actually bringing you the good news? The good news is you can't do it. I know I've said this here before. In one of my messages, there's only the three points that stand out in my mind. I can't, he can, and he will help me. That's what we really need to hear, is that in all of my trying, I am entirely a failure. But he's not. And he says, if I'll open my heart and let him come in, not only will he remove my sin and put the blood down for my past and release me from my pain, my penalty, my punishment, but he will then fill me with his own life and cause me to be able to stand upright and say, now he can in me. That's good news. Because I don't have to try harder. I just have to surrender more. We sang about surrendering. And uh, I surrender all. You know, some of us need to get rid of the other song we've been singing. You, you know that one? I surrender some. <laughs> you know, it's, a, it's an edge on the song we got to lose. But if we'll surrender all, and I want to surrender all, you no doubt want to surrender all, and we wrestle with it, because the old man doesn't want to let go. But he's dead. He's dead, and dead men don't struggle. Amen. 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 I'm alive in Christ. Jesus wins. This is good news. So the scripture was read for us earlier, Matthew 7, where we start today, 3 through 5. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye? Pay no attention to the plank in your own. How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there's a plank in your own eye? This word plank, by the way, is, is like this beam right here. You know, this beam you have, you put in to make the, hold this whole thing up. That's the word. It's not just a little stick. It's a six by 12 or a six by 18 lamb or whatever. It's hanging out of your face. You say, here, let me get that for you. I see you got a speck of dust. I don't know how you could have got the, saw the dust anyway with this thing hanging out of your head. But if you saw that coming at you saying, hey, let me get that out of your, your eye, what would you do? Uh, no thanks, right? I had imagined that I could get somebody, one of you to, and maybe we already have somebody in the congregation with a white cane and that's blind and glasses. And at this point in the message, go, oh, oh, I got something in there. And have them walk in and say, I'll take care of that for you. And watch what your reaction would be. Would anybody say, stop, you're never going to be able to do this? Because you're blind, you couldn't possibly see the speck in my eye. So how is it that we approach somebody else with our own issue, saying, I want to take care of yours. I think you need to change. This is Jesus speaking, right? Kind of hard to wrestle with the red letters in the Bible. You know, there's a, well, maybe there's another, let's look somewhere else. Maybe there's something else. And perhaps if this is your struggle, wanting to change the people around you, perhaps that's what you're doing. I did this. Based on the need for this message this morning, I thought, I'm going to look through the scriptures and I'm going to find out where we get to change somebody else. I, I wrote down the scriptures right here. I have them. I have the answer sheet. And as I have in the past, I made copies. So if somebody helped me hand out the answer sheet, this is our moment. We get to finally discover how we're going to change somebody else. I better keep one. I need the answers too.
Now, when you get this, on, I, mean, I apologize for the small print, but I wanted to get everything on one page, front and back. So you can get a magnifying glass. On the one side at the top, it says the 59 one another's of the New Testament. As you're getting your sheet, I'll just read some of them. Be at peace with each other. Wash one another's feet. Love one another. Love one another. Love one another. <clears throat> Love one another. Right there, let's just skip to the bottom of the page where I've written 21 of the 59 or fully one third call for Christians to love. Taking into consideration other duplicates, greet one another with a holy kiss, encourage one another, forgive one another, etc. There are close to 30, closer to 32 individual one another passages in the New Testament. This has become extremely important to me. This is like a Bible study Sunday school lesson, really, for a lot of us. Oh, we've heard this before. I understand there are a lot of one another's in the Bible. But as I continue down this list, be devoted to one another in brotherly love, honor one uh, another above yourselves, live in harmony with one another, again, love one another, I get to number 12. This is the only one another that deals with judging others of all the one another's in the New Testament. And it says what? Stop passing judgment on one another. The danger that's involved in wanting to change the people around is, is that we, almost without recognizing it, we slide ourselves up into the throne where the just judge of all men is seated. That's God the Father. We are deciding to take his seat because of the, what Jesus is teaching when he says, judge that you don't, don't judge not so that you're not judged. Again, it goes into the Greek. The definitions are different. In English, it just says judge. But for us, if we can see this, when it says judge not, it means quit condemning people. Quit sitting in the throne of God and deciding their fate. Because the judgment you're using, and I'll get the Greek wrong, and I don't mind. I hope you don't. It goes out on the YouTube, and I'll be attacked by someone. That's fine. I've been attacked before for being ignorant, but I'm not stupid. Crino. And in my mind, because I'm a simple sort of guy, I, I hear, quit creaming people. <laughs> crino. Don't crino people. Don't judge them to the end where you actually have to pronounce them, you're condemned, I judge you, you're finally, it's over. You're defeated. Jesus says, stop doing that because if you do that to others, the same thing will come back to you. Now, other passages in the New Testament deal with the word of judge. In our English Bible, say judge, and we're instructed to judge things. It's a different Greek word. It means to evaluate. It means to look at two things or a group of things and evaluate between them and come to a good decision. You know, guys, that's what we did when we were looking for our bride. We looked at everything that was available. We did the evaluation. We said, that's the one for me. Hopefully. You're supposed to evaluate between right and wrong. You're supposed to. We are, as believers, are, are encouraged by the scriptures to evaluate and look at things and come to a good conclusion. Scriptural-based answers. But Jesus is warning, quit judging to condemn them. And when you want to change somebody else, isn't that kind of aligned with the moment of saying, I don't like the way they are. I condemn who they are right now. I want them to be something different for me. Jesus says, stop it. The one and others that I've listed here pretty much give us the directions of how to help change somebody else. We love them. Oh, not that again. It always comes down to something like that, doesn't it? I mean, isn't there another answer? Do I have to love them? 
Well, it's hard to love them if you're an enabler. It's hard to love if you're a codependent. If you can't live without them and you don't have individual strength in yourself to know who you are in Christ, it's, it can be difficult to love others. But the Bible's still the Bible, and that's the answer book, right? Love one another. Forgive one another. Serve one another in love. Accept one another just as Christ accepts you. Instruct one another. Oh, there it is. There's my end. I can teach them. I can get after them. Well, sure you can. But if your motive is love, why wouldn't you? If your motive is love. Remember when Jesus was eating dinner with the boys? And he, and he gets up from dinner, puts on the towel, gets the basin. Nobody's really excited about the moment. Nobody says anything. And he washes all their feet. He gets up and he puts the bowl and the towel aside. Says, hey boys, do you know what I've done? Even at that point, no one spoke as far as our record shows. They just were, don't say something stupid, Peter. Please. (laughs) Not now. (laughs) They all were quiet because they knew he had the answer. You ever notice that when God asks you a question, it's not because he's looking for an answer? (laughs) He already knows. He wants to know if you know. Do you know what I've done? He said, you call me Lord and Master. Rightly so, because I am. And today I've shown you how you should live by washing others' feet. And he concludes this moment of teaching them by saying, happy are you you know these things and you do them it's we're unhappy when we know these things and we don't do them we're unhappy when we know that we should serve and wash another person's feet love them to the point where Jesus could come in he's the one that makes the changes he's the one that can alter the heart I can't I might change the mind I, that was not my effect Does that mean? I do this every time What did I do? I thought somebody jumped out of the baptistry. <laughs> what, what happened? Um, can we rewind that part? Where was I when I fell off the truck? Somebody help me. Evidently, no one was hanging on the edge of that sentence. <laughs> okay, we're moving on. <laughs> I'd like to rewind. I've done this before. What was that? Jeff. (laughs) That's who I am. (laughs) Yeah. You're unhappy if you know these things and you don't do them. You know you're supposed to love people, serve others. The ones around you that are irritating you, Jesus says, why don't you grab the bowl and the towel and figure out how to wash their feet? What is it they need? Well, they need the change. (laughs) I've been telling you that. (laughs) Well, no, they they need help. They need somebody to love. They need to be able to see Jesus. Jesus doesn't come to us. He doesn't come to me and my devotional time and go, you better change. I've never had him do that to me. Boy, can he affect change in me though, right? It comes by the Spirit and he just surrounds my heart with love. And when I am undoubtedly in his presence and I know I am loved beyond the shadow of a doubt, then he says, I bet we could do this together. You've been a little stupid recent, but I can help you with that. I'm sorry, I used the S word in church. I said stupid. Shame. Shame. <laughs> And under the moment of his love, I want to change. I want to be like him. It's an invitation to be Christ-like that he extends to me. How do I change the people around me? I become Christ-like to them. I love them unconditionally. 
It doesn't mean I have to condone or agree with all their behaviors or all their messes, but I can love them anyway. In humility, number 29, consider others better than yourselves. If you can develop that attitude, it's not hard to move forward in working with others. If you can have, and this is where you, you win the battle against enabling and codependency as well, is when you can look at yourself and say, I know who I am in Christ. And I could have brought you a whole other list of those scriptures, but they're in your Bible. You're forgiven, you're loved, you're, you're more than a conqueror. There's a lot of things about who you are in Christ. And when you can stand and say, I know who I am in Christ, I am accepted in the beloved. He treats me and calls me his son and his own. I am, I, am, I am accepted into the presence of the creator of the universe who can stand against that. And in that esteem that comes from how God sees you, even in that esteem, you can say, I choose to believe that others, and I will esteem others higher than myself. Yeah, I'll open the door for anybody else to go through first. I will take my proper position of being in the readiness to wash the feet. I don't live in my own puffed upness. 1 Corinthians 8 says, knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. In that passage, it's interesting, in 1 Corinthians 8 and Romans chapter 14, Paul the apostle deals with the issue of eating food dedicated to idols. And I'm not going to get lost in that this morning. Except that in both those passages, he says, let's quit judging each other. One says, I can eat. The other one says, I can't eat. We shouldn't. It's offered idols. What are we going to do about this? And there's this conscience problem, and there's a wrestling match of right and wrong. And Paul says, hey, there's only one God in the entire universe. It doesn't matter where the meat's been. If, even if mentally it was offered to a, a God, there is no God there. There's only one God. His name is Jesus. So the food is not a problem. He said, what the problem is, is you're judging each other. You shouldn't eat. You should. We do. We don't. They do. We don't. Right? And there's this differentiation that's going on. I said, hey, stop judging each other and begin to love one another. Begin to esteem the other person higher than yourself. Begin to say, what was Jesus wanting to do through me to help them? Well, yeah, it's obvious they need to change. And when you look in the mirror, it's obvious that needs change as well. When, we look in, when I say look in the mirror, I don't always mean the one in your bathroom. The Bible says this is the mirror that we look into. This is the law of life. This is the law of liberty. And it speaks to us and it mirrors us when we read it. It's not hard to see change is necessary. But even if I need change, even if my, you know, my, my actions need a rehaul, an overhaul, God does not reject me when he approaches me. He's not saying, you better take care of this or you're out. He says, hey, I'm here because I love you and I've noticed. I bet you really don't want to live like that. Let's look at this. And you look into the mirror of, of the law of life and you go, there's a better life for me. There's a, there's a closer, a, a more close position to me and Jesus now. I can... He's inviting me in. I want that. I want to draw close to him. I was listening to a man named Graham Cook. I don't know if some of you know Graham Cook or not. I, I don't follow him, but someone handed me something he had taught on, and I was listening to it. And he said, every action that we take comes first from a thought. And I... Okay, let that settle in a second. <laughs> Everything comes from a thought. He said, if, if you don't like how things are going, get a new thought. Get a new thought. That just sounds too easy. He said, God can give you a new thought. And you don't have to be always worrying about trying to get rid of the old ones. If you get new ones, the old ones will drop off. God's not trying to change you. He's trying to lead you into life. And when it's like the trees. We're looking at it now. It's spring. 
The trees are, if you, when you were walking in, if you, or when you leave today, stop just on the porch, look across at the tree that's trying to bud, and listen. You're not going to hear this. <coughs> you just don't hear that. The tree's not really working hard at, <coughs> I got to get these buds out, you know. <coughs> oh, they're just all stuffed up in my limbs. So uncomfortable. I'm just going to grunt them out. <coughs> no. It's, it's ridiculous, isn't it? <laughs> I thought I heard somebody say, this guy is nuts. <laughs> They're not. What's it doing? It's just doing what comes natural. It's pulling the life up through the roots. And here comes the new life. And here comes the new sap. And eventually it's out there at the limbs. And even the deadest leaf that's hung on through the whole winter, which wasn't much to talk about this year, that leaf resisted letting go all winter. But now there's a little new life behind it and it's going and it just nudges it out of the way. It floats to the ground and we didn't have to work too hard at it. All we had to do was replace the life flow. And now here comes new life. Amen. Our actions with the actions of others that may not quite line up with what we think it should with the life of Christ doesn't need us to go in with a machete and try and hack off all the dead leaves of their, of their limbs. We need to get with them, get alongside of them, love them so much like Jesus does, agree with him that he wants his life to flow in them and say, how can I help that happen? And for some of us, maybe it just means we need to be quiet. We need to close it. Mm-hmm. I shouldn't preach on that. That would be difficult. My pastor from Mexico tells the story of the lady that goes to the priest and says, you know, my, my husband comes home from work every day and he, he gets angry with me and he yells and then pretty soon he gets violent sometimes. What do, I, what do I do? He says, I've got just what you need. He goes in the back, comes out with a little vial. Of, he says, this is holy water. He says, what I want you to do is every time when you see him coming in, coming in from work, you go quick, get a teaspoon, take a teaspoon of this holy water, put it in your mouth. He says, but don't swallow it. Don't swallow it. Hold it there. Serve him his dinner. Let him get settled. She comes back a week later and says, I need some more of that water. Now, some of you have got it figured out. He was coming home and she was just, meh, meh, meh. And he was going ballistic. You know? I need, you need change, you need change, you need change. And he, button it up. Get the holy water out, put it in there, hold it, let God do the work. If love one another gets fully one-third of all these scriptures. And on the back, by the way, the other list, I didn't point it out, but there are 55 sentences from scripture here. Or, uh, they're not 55 separate items. There are 55 references on this side to the same issue of what we're supposed to do with one another. And when you look through the scriptures and you find all these, you never find one that says judge each other, condemn each other, roast each other, work each other over. It's not there. It's always love one another, serve one another. And I, I've said this before here. I will say it everywhere I go, so forgive me for repeating myself, but you cannot do these things by yourself. We can't do it alone. We can't do it in a closet. We have to be with people to make these things work. That's why I, I really get excited when I look in your, your bulletin and I talk to Pastor Bill about life groups. And yes, this is, a, this is a commercial interruption. If you're not in a life group, consider being in one. Consider forming one. Pray about leading one. Pray about hosting one. Because it's only when we get together that these things really start working out. And when I say working out, I mean working out in us. 
And as I laughingly say most of the time, when it says forgive one another, that means you have to be close enough for somebody to hack you off and to make you mad or upset you and to have something to forgive. But Jesus said, and the scriptures teach, forgive one another. Well, I'm going to have to be just close enough for you to really get to know me. And then you'll forgive me because you love me. And I'll forgive you because I love you. And we'll do that because he loves us. And what did Jesus say about us in our demonstration to the world? They'll know you're my disciples because you love one another. Not because you do good works, not because you go down, feed the poor, not because you do prison ministry, not because you're in a life group. They're going to know because you love each other. That's the earmark of a believer. I'm going to do something I've never done here before. I'm going to close on time. (laughs) I'm going to look look right into the camera and say, I'm going to do it, Pastor Bill. (laughs) To consider asking God to forgive you. Not that you're bad or you're evil. I say, God... I don't want to be the change agent anymore. I'm, I'm, a, I'm sorry I've tried to get into your seat and be the judge of all men. Make it right. Make me right. Holy Spirit, we invite you to come right now in this moment and minister to us as only you can. You have the ability to bring life inside of us just like the tree we talked about, fill us all the way through with yourself, with your life, with your attitudes, with your character traits, so that that new life and that new thinking and that new understanding that you want us to have about who we are in you pushes everything else off and brings victory and life to the full. Life abundant. Life without fear. Life without having to be codependent or be an enabler or having to be unpleasant about people around us. Help us to be like you in washing the feet of others and serving one another, loving one another, forgiving and fulfilling the law of Christ. Release us from the past and the anxieties of working on others, and help us work with you. Help us to cooperate with you in the growth and maturity that you desire for each of us. And Father, I pray that you would put us together with others so that we can practice your one another's. Put us next to people, Lord, that we can really live with and get along with and grow together with. People we can experience these parts of your life and scripture together with that we could be a demonstration to this community of people that really do sincerely honestly practice loving one another in Jesus name for his sake and his glory be jealous for your glory today